Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the invitation. I'm very humbled to speak uh, in front of you. And uh, despite this difficult situation, we are still able to connect with each other. And I hope uh, my presentation, our lecture would be beneficial uh, for you all. Uh, so before we dive in uh, together in the strategy of Turkey in Syria, I would like to mention that uh, Syria and Turkey had enjoyed very good relations between 2005 and 2011. Uh, the relations were not only improved on the diplomatic and economic levels, but also even on family levels between Assad and Erdogan. However, uh, this has changed dramatically after the Syrian crisis uh, uh, erupted in March 2011. And this is the topic of my uh, pre presentation today. Um, since the beginning of the crisis in Syria in early 2011, uh, the statesmen and the politicians in Turkey uh, they were confident that one of the keys for regional hegemony in the Middle East passes through Syria. So in June 2011, uh, after the eruption of the anti-government protests against Assad, um, a Western diplomat, he revealed uh, to the Association of France Press that Erdogan offered President Assad via his foreign minister, back then uh, he was uh, Davut Oglo, a plan that includes um, uh, the Syrian president to ensure between a quarter and a third of ministers in his government to be members of the outlawed Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood history is very controversial in Syria, especially in late uh, 70s, uh, when they rose against the former president of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, and they rebelled against him. Uh, it was a military, it was an armed rebellion against Hafez al-Assad, and Hafez al-Assad crushed this uh, rebellion, especially in the city of Hama and Aleppo. And since then, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, outlawed by um, Syria, and it is considered a terrorist organization. Um, so Erdogan, Erdogan offered this uh, to President Assad, and on the other hand, uh, he committed that he will use all his influence to end the rebellion in Syria. But the plan uh, was considered in Syria as uh, some sort of uh, soft penetration of the uh, Syrian ruling elite and a preface uh, to change the pan-Arabist nature of Syria. So the offer was rejected by Assad and the AKP government declared its full support uh, to the opposition groups and thus the formation of the uh, so-called Free Syrian Army, FSR, in July 2011, and the Turkish-backed Syrian National Council, SNC, in August 2011. So the formation of these political and military groups came just one month after Erdogan's offer uh, uh, that was rejected uh, to President Assad, which was rejected by Syria. Now, before going to the reasons and motives of Erdogan, um, the zero problems policy, which was adopted during the era of uh, Davut Oglo, is briefly explained in the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. If we go to the website, we can find it, and I quote, aware that development and progress in real terms can only be achieved in a lasting peace and stability environment. Turkey places this objective at the very center of her foreign policy vision. This approach is a natural reflection of the peace at home, peace in the world. However, uh, in order to understand the Turkish policy shift from zero problems with neighbors to nothing but problems with neighbors, one should dive in the history of the Ottoman Empire to understand the motives of the uh, neo-Ottoman ambitions of um, the current president Erdogan. Now, historically, the Ottomans who came uh, from the Balkans, they succeeded to extend their influence in Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Red Sea, the, Arab, the Arabian Peninsula, um, North and East Africa, all through Syria. So this is why the Ottomans uh, called uh, uh, Syria the Honorable Levant, or in Arabic, Sham Sharif. Now, Erdogan's new Ottoman dream revived in the light of the Arab Spring uh, because the Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood succeeded during 2011 and 2012 <clears throat> uh, to reach power in uh, Tunisia and Egypt. So it was a great political moment for Erdogan to extend his hands uh, to the MENA region. <clears throat> 
So while the Islamists uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, especially in, of uh, Syria, have paved the way for further meddling of uh, Erdogan in the Syrian affairs, Erdogan uh, provided financial, logistic, and military facilities to the political and military wings of the Syrian opposition, namely the Free Syrian Army <coughs> and later the uh, Al-Nusra Front or uh, HDS. This doesn't mean that Turkey didn't <coughs> help ISIS, but it helped it indirectly. For example, uh, ISIS uh, conquered uh, most of eastern Syria um, uh, until uh, September 2015, and uh, they conquered uh, Syria's half, that means conquered Syria's half of uh, oil and energy resources. And by doing so, um, uh, ISIS started to export uh, the Syrian oil into the Turkish black market. And by doing so, it was only ISIS, only then ISIS was able to declare itself as an Islamic state. As a state, you need to have a stable income. So ISIS secured its stable income by selling uh, the Syrian oil into the Turkish uh, black market. And that's why the Syrian side accuses uh, um, Turkey of uh, also supporting uh, ISIS. Uh, beside ISIS, uh, the Turkish intelligence uh, has turned a blind eye to the flow of thousands of foreign mercenaries and terrorists through the Turkish airports uh, entering Syria. So in my opinion, it was a reckless policy that turned uh, Syria's southern neighbor into the world's largest safe haven for Al-Qaeda terrorists. Uh, this is not my words, but the words of uh, Brett Markirk, the United States envoy uh, to the anti-ISIS coalition uh, in Syria. Now, Turkey's geography has always been surrounded by deadly risks and intervening in Syria's domestic affairs in my opinion, was not the smartest thing that Syria could have done for its own security reasons. Now, I have read uh, the book uh, Turkish Foreign Policy by Muriel Mirak Weisbach and Dr. Jamal Rakim, and uh, both are experts on the Turkish uh, affairs, and the authors documented the rise of the AKP government and the new Ottoman project. And I would like to mention a few important things uh, from this book. So since the beginning uh, of the AKP rule, uh, the former uh, foreign minister and then prime minister of Turkey, uh, Ahmed Davut Oglu, he believed that Turkey is heading towards a leadership role because it is, a, I quote, it is a modern state, a modern Islamic state with a great Ottoman heritage and geostrategic, geopolitical and geoeconomic position. Although Daoud Oglo refused the allegations that he is, such, uh, he is seeking the reformation of an Ottoman Empire, but he suggested a British-style Commonwealth instead. That means if Britain is the successor of the British Empire, then Turkey is the successor of the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, Daoud Oglo's unofficial Islamic Commonwealth was a plan to embrace the persecuted and insulted Arab and Muslim populations under Turkey's banner. And when Dawood Oglo was asked how Turkey is able to do these changes, he once again referred to Turkey's great Ottoman history in addition to modernization. This is very important to understand, especially the, the part that Dawood Oglo mentioned, the persecuted and insulted Arab uh, people. We have to understand the history of the Middle East and the Muslim population, especially that in the last decades, they suffered many defeats, military defeats, uh, starting from the 67 war, uh, the Pan-Arabists uh, uh, received a major blow by uh, Israel, and after that, despite the 73 war, uh, a lot of uh, setbacks uh, happened uh, in the Arab world in 1991. Uh, Iraq was bombed, uh, Somalia um, in 2001, Afghanistan in 2003, Iraq again. In 2005, Rafik al-Hariri was assassinated. All these incidents uh, were accumulation for, especially for the Sunni Muslims, uh, and they felt that they are persecuted, they felt that they are weak, and they're starving for victories. Uh, unlike uh, the Sunni uh, population, the Shiites in the Middle East, they felt empowered, especially after um, the rise of uh, the, uh, the Islamic State in uh, in Iran. And uh, in 2006, for example, there was the war between Hezbollah and um, uh, Israel, and 
the Shiites after this war felt much more empowered and their rights are uh, secured and their position, uh, politically speaking, is much better. Unlike the Sunnis who felt persecuted and weak, and this has led to the rise of some uh, Sunni Islamic figures who wanted to fill this vacuum and make the Muslims feel that they are no more persecuted, such as the example of Sheikh uh, uh, Al-Asir in Saida in Lebanon, who was again defeated with the participation of uh, Hezbollah. Therefore, this feeling uh, of persecution increased again. And Erdogan, uh, in this current situation, he tried to uh, give a hand to the Muslim population and uh, tell them that he's here to save them from uh, uh, this persecution and weakness, and he presents himself as the Sultan or the Caliph in this regard. Now, although Dawood Oglo and Erdogan had disagreements later, Erdogan still follows this new Ottoman project uh, that his for former foreign minister had designed. However, a few uh, major incidents have slowed down uh, Turkey's new Ottoman tendencies. Number one, which is the repercussion of terrorism in Syria, have posed serious challenges to the internal stability in Turkey. Uh, I mean, if you turn your neighbor into Afghanistan, then you will become uh, a Pakistan. Two, uh, the coup against President Morsi and cutting the bridges with Egypt military backed interim government or the government who listed the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Egypt is a very strong and major uh, country in the MENA region and uh, cutting the relationships or unfriendly relationships with uh, Egypt uh, was uh, followed by the brutal coup of uh, Morsi against the Muslim Brotherhood government and the extermination of the leaderships of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in uh, Egypt. The third reason is the resignation of Emir Hamad bin Khalifa al Thani and passing the reign to his son Tamim. Although Tamim and his father both have good relationship with Turkey and Erdogan personally, but the resignation has led uh, to the partial isolation of the tiny Qatar's role after the Arab Spring, while giving Turkey's rival Saudi Arabia a bigger role. Now, if we check the geopolitics of the Middle East, we will see that even among the Sunni powers, uh, there is a rift, uh, like Saudi Arabia and the UAE are uh, mostly together, and the other side there is Turkey and uh, Qatar. And this uh, competition, we can see it clearly in Egypt uh, uh, between Haftar and his opponents. The fourth reason is the Turkish uh, Qatari-backed uh, Free Syrian Army faced in the shadow of the other Salafi and Takfiri groups. Most importantly, ISIS and uh, HDS. And Ankara found herself found herself in a position which any support to the so-called rebels in Syria now means empowering the most radical elements of the anti-Assad groups. This doesn't mean that Turkey is not supporting HDS, especially in Idlib, because we can see clearly that uh, Turkey has a great influence over HDS. And uh, despite the resistance of the HDS in, in certain uh, uh, affairs, but uh, Turkey uh, has a big uh, role uh, with the HDS in implementing, uh, especially the Turkish and Russian deals uh, in the in that file. Now, a uh, few, few years later, uh, when the situation has changed, especially after the intervention of Russia in Syria, uh, Russia tried to contain the, uh, the advancement or the advances or the, the occupation and uh, of Turkey to the Syrian territories. So they agreed on the escalation zones, uh, which included uh, Dara, the suburbs of Damascus, northern Homs, and Idlib. The escalation zones uh, succeeded. In the suburbs of Damascus and northern Hamas, uh, uh, through uh, diplomatic and military means, sometimes only with diplomacy, reconciliation, especially in Dara, and sometimes with military force, especially in the suburbs of Damascus. But it, it but in Idlib, it didn't succeed through diplomacy. So, uh, and it was like the escalation zone, especially in Idlib, it was meant that Turkey will impose. Uh, withdrawing uh, will impose a situation that the militants should withdraw 20 kilometers from the front line into the city of Idlib, and they should disarm uh, the hardcore jihadis and stop shelling the uh, residential towns in the northern parts of Hama. But after the failure of Turkey to imp in implementing the agreement, the Syrian army, backed uh, by the Russian Air Force, restored the M5 highway, which links Aleppo 
to Hama Homs, uh, Damascus, and uh, Dara. Uh, now, there is uh, uh, negotiations over the M4 highway, uh, where uh, the Turkish and the Russian side have uh, uh, joint patrols together. Um, uh, but until this moment, the HDS is resisting this uh, agreement, and they are even attacking the patrols, the joint patrols in, uh, in Idlib. Uh, so I believe if the the implement the, if the agreement fails in the coming weeks and months, uh, the Syrian army will uh, continue the military operation from uh, different joints, uh, first from uh, southern Aleppo into northern uh, Idlib, and the second joint from northern Hama to the southern Idlib, and the third joint is from northern Latakia to just Shurud. And Jusuf Shukur is very important, and I believe the main focus of the military operation will be on Jusuf Shukur because uh, uh, thousands of multinational jihadists, including um, a few thousand Uyghurs who came all the way from Western China, uh, Xinjiang to uh, Hatay and from Hatay to Syria, and they settled there. So this is a very important file that needs to be addressed. Uh, I think China will play a role to see how can they uh, solve the situation of uh, thousands of Uyghurs who are now very well armed and trained uh, uh, to fight and conduct uh, uh, terrorist uh, attacks in, in Syria and as well. So there is this case of Idlib and then there is the case of northern Syria. The northern Syria is separated, in my opinion, from the Idlib case. And uh, Turkey there occupies the northern belt of Syria that stretch from Afrin to Jarabnos and from Tel Abya to Qabr, uh, Qabr uh, Khadrawi. In my opinion, these areas are very difficult for Syria to recapture because Ankara is working hard uh, to impose new realities on the ground in northern Syria. And this is happening to changing the demographics of the area and the Turkification of the people via schools, universities, and cultural centers. Uh, even the headquarters of the Syrian opposition in northern Syria, uh, first of all, this Turkification is not new. Uh, during the era of the Ottoman Empire, it was a state policy. Uh, so uh, Erdogan revived this policy in northern Syria. And uh, if we go to northern Syria, for example, to Jarablus or Mbej, we can see that the headquarters of the Syrian opposition uh, they raise all Turkish flag and the Erdogan pictures are over uh, their buildings and they even uh, dealing with Turkish lira and not with Syrian pound or dollar or any other currency. Now, last time I talked about this topic, uh, especially on my channel, Syriana Analysis, uh, it stirred uh, controversy, but I believe Erdogan's Turkey has geopolitical ambitions and one of these ambitions passes through Syria. So taking this into consideration, Erdogan wants to grab more lands from Syria to the so-called safe zone, this belt that Turkey created and uh, uh, they conducted an incursion uh, and they occupied some parts of northern Syria, so they call it safe zones, but in my opinion, this is only a fancy term uh, to the occupation. Now, some could ask, will, will Turkey withdraw from northern Syria? They could. Maybe in the future, not now, but uh, Turkey could uh, eventually uh, withdraw but its, occup its occupation forces from Syria, but it will do so only when Ankara imposes a status quo stretched from Idlib to Kamishli, all the way from, east, uh, from west to east, where more pro Erdogan people are inten intended to replace the indigenous people of the area, especially the, the Kurds, Assyrians, and Armenians. And in order to create a client entity that pursues Turkey's interests instead of that of Syria. Now, I would like to stress, uh, uh, I would like to stress the fact that Erdogan's Turkey is pursuing uh, a colonial project and is occupying territories similar to Israel. Um, but Turkish occupation is far more dangerous than the Israeli one for a few simple reasons. One, Turkey has a much bigger army and is uh, already uh, showing that it wants to project its growing military power in, in the region, especially in Syria, in Libya, in Iraq, and now in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And the second reason is, which is very important, is the cultural, religious, and ideological aspect. Like, Israel cannot impose uh, Judaism on the Muslims and the Christians of Palestine or the Golan Heights, whereas Turkey, considering the historical, cultural, and religious factors, 
is able to Turkify the Syrian refugees in his country and uh, the displaced Syrians, for example, in Afrin, Jarabos, Nambij, etc. So the curriculum, for example, nowadays in northern Syria is Turkish. It's a Turkish curriculum. They teach them Turkish, they teach them the Kurdish uh, culture. And if we wait 10 or 20 years um, in this similar situation, we could find an entire generation that speaks uh, Turkish and feels Turkish and their loyalty is to Erdogan and not to Syria. And this explains why Turkey is uh, granting Turkish citizenship to the leaders of the Syrian opposition and the mercenaries who fight for Erdogan in Syria, Libya, and now in Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan is also another very important example of how Erdogan is trying to extend its hands not only in the MENA region now, but also in Southern Caucasus. Uh, this is very important. I just want to mention this example. Uh, in the first two weeks of the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia over Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, uh, Erdogan sent uh, around 4,000 mercenaries from the Free Syrian Army, uh, Sultan Murad, uh, Al Hamze Group, etc., etc., and uh, they are now fighting alongside the Azerbaijani army. And only a few days ago, uh, there are uh, reliable uh, reports coming from northern Syria. Uh, indicate that Erdogan wants to send uh, 2,300 more mercenaries from the Free Syrian Army to the Azerbaijani conflict. And by doing so, um, in my opinion, he's creating a new hotspot for radical jihadists in the Southern Caucasus. And this will alarm both uh, Iran and, and, uh, and Russia. Uh, I mean, if, if Syria fell in the hands uh, uh, of the Islamists, the second step was to uh, extend this project to Iran. Uh, but since it failed and Iran intervened in Syria to foil this project, now Erdogan is taking this uh, jihadist on the borders with Iran. It's on the northern borders of Iran. So this situation could develop in the near future and we could see a further uh, uh, intervention and by Russia, by Iran, now by Turkey and Azerbaijan and Armenia. So uh, I hope that the, uh, the file of Nagorno-Karabakh could not turn to, into another Syria file that could last uh, for 10 years maybe, but uh, the, uh, all, the, all the realities underground indicate that this war is not going to end very soon and Azerbaijan is determined, determined to uh, occupy the entire Nagorno-Karabakh uh, with these uh, Syrian mercenaries, which are sent by Turkey. And we could see a much uh, bigger bloodshed in that region and an explosion of the Southern Caucasus, which is very rich of, uh, also by um, uh, natural resources. So another geopolitical war or battle could be, could be uh, triggered by Erdogan in that region. We hope, I hope that I'm wrong in this regard, and we wish uh, that this conflict would be solved peacefully in a diplomatic way or between all sides to save lives and that everyone uh, lives uh, in peace uh, in that region. Uh, this was my uh, presentation regarding the Turkish uh, uh, strategy in, in Syria, Middle East, and now in the Southern Caucasus. And if there are any questions, I'm ready uh, to answer uh, for the questions. I would be much more than happy to, to do that. Thank you so much, Kevar. I guess the audiences can unmute themselves and ask a question of choice. May I first use my headphones because uh, I'm not hearing well. Okay. So, Ivana, Gina, Rasan, anyone wants to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Do you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yes, I'm ready to take the questions. Okay, so, till the time others come with questions, we have two questions. One is my own, I'll ask first. So, Turkey strength, as you mentioned, Dao Dablo, and all of them. So much of it is historical, as in the sense of looking at it from the prism of, um, how do I say, Ottoman Empire and all that. But how much of it is also based on Turkey's strength, military and political? Actually, both are very important. Uh, Erdogan, for a public consumption, is using the historical example in order to mobilize the people and gain, uh, like, uh, 
millions of uh, Arabs and Muslims on his side, reminding them of the victories of the past and the, uh, how successful was the Ottoman Empire. However, uh, militarily speaking, as you mentioned, uh, for example, a few, uh, like in the last 10 years, uh, Erdogan uh, uh, um, invested uh, uh, on, on the naval force of, of uh, Turkey, which is very, very important. Uh, we remember during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, there is the theory of uh, the land power and the sea power. And obviously, Erdogan uh, is uh, trying to balance between the land power and the sea power, and he's creating a very strong and big uh, naval uh, uh, power in the Mediterranean. And this has caused a few problems with Greece over the gas uh, uh, sources in the Mediterranean uh, with Libya and also with France. So uh, the military power is very important for Turkey. Uh, for example, I want to mention uh, the, the drone power. The drone's power nowadays is uh, it's, it's a very deadly weapon. We have seen this in Idlib and how the Syrian army was incapable of uh, stopping these drone attacks. And, and uh, it was only when they moved some of the Panzer S1 systems uh, from Damascus, which were designed to protect the skies of Damascus from the Israeli attacks to the north. Uh, uh, they were able to gun down a few drones, but uh, uh, but the realities on the ground say the Turkish drones are much more sophisticated and deadly than the Israeli ones. If we see uh, the current conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the Azerbaijani side is using both the Israeli and the Turkish uh, drones, but the ones that are mostly immune uh, from uh, gunning down or they're, they're uh, causing the biggest trouble for uh, the Armenian forces there is the Turkish drone. The Israeli one is deadly and strong and the technology is uh, very uh, high. However, uh, even the old S-200 uh, systems were able to um, uh, able to uh, gun down the Israeli ones, but the Turkish ones were very uh, complicated. So I agree with uh, with you, and I agree with the uh, co uh, the concept that, of course, ideology, uh, history, past, culture are all important pillars if you want to build an empire. But the military is the one that enforces these new realities on the ground, and Turkey. Uh, proved over and over again that it is ready to use direct military, po direct military power and indirect mili military power. And if we see the birth rate in Turkey is much higher than, for example, in Iran. And this is uh, 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 one of the reasons why I think and some analysts think that Turkey is uh, going to be the major, uh, the biggest uh, uh, regional power in the region uh, in the near future. Thank you so much, Kevok. So, and Egina, Ivana, you want to ask any questions? You want me to unmute you, maybe? Okay. So, hello. Um, I have a question. You mentioned um, mentioned um, uh, Islamist fighters. Uh, what's their role in the whole situation? Um, are they do they present um, a serious problem in Syria or in, in Azerbaijan? In Syria. Actually, the vast majority of the militants nowadays, we are talking about uh, around 60,000 fighters in uh, Idlib. The vast majority of them are hardcore jihadists. Um, I want to mention, uh, I already mentioned the example of the de-escalation zones and the reconciliation uh, process between the Syrian government and the former rebels. But the hardcore jihadists, for example, in Daraa, in Damascus, in Aleppo, in Homs, in Deir Ezzor, those who refused to reconcile with the Syrian government, they sent them all via buses, uh, green buses, to Idlib. So tens of thousands of them uh, uh, are gathered there. 
And according to the uh, United States anti-ISIS, uh, uh, the spokesperson of the anti-ISIS uh, uh, campaign in Syria, uh, the United States believes and the Pentagon believes that Idlib is the uh, largest safe haven for Al-Qaeda terrorists uh, in the world after 9-11. So uh, we have uh, fighters from the HDS. HDS is Al Qaeda. Uh, their numbers are big, around 20,000 fighters. We have fighters from Tajikistan. We have uh, fighters from Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And we have uh, thousands of fighters from um, uh, Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghurs. And uh, the, the fate and the destiny of these fighters is unknown because uh, no country wants to take them back uh, to their original countries. And fighting against them is very deadly. This, uh, they, they already built uh, fortifications, very strong ones. Like I just want to mention the example of Northern Latakia. There is a hill called Kabani in Northern Latakia, and the Syrian government was not able to advance to the north uh, to this hill in the last five years. Even despite the strong Russian military presence and the Air Force and bombing 24 hours on this hill, they were not able to push back the hardcore Chechen jihadists, the hardcore Uyghur jihadists, uh, who, made, who created, uh, built a very uh, strong fortifications and they're fighting inside the mountains and they created caves and tunnels under the ground. Therefore, uh, um, it is very important to give uh, a chance for diplomacy between uh, Turkey and, uh, and uh, Russia uh, uh, in order for Turkey to try to disarm these jihadists. But in my humble opinion, uh, it's either Turkey doesn't have the will to implement this agreement or it's not able. And at the end of the day, um, I believe there will be a military uh, campaign once again uh, by the Syrian government in order to at least secure the M4 highway, which links Aleppo to the coastal uh, cities, especially Latakia and Tartus. So yes, the multinational jihadists are uh, they exist in Idlib, they are very strong, but alongside them, uh, uh, because of the war situation and the last 10 years and the indoctrination of the radical imams and sheikhs to some Syrian youngsters, unfortunately, we also have a big number of Syrian, uh, uh, I call them jihadists nowadays, and they believe they share the same ideology with Al-Qaeda, basically the names and the brands differ, but the ideology is almost the same. Anyone else has a question to ask? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you so much. So, Egina Gelfan, do you have a question to ask? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I wrote my uh, question in the chatbot because uh, my English is not very good. Um, so, I, um, I ask you to recommend uh, some articles of key work, uh, mm -hmm. if it is possible, okay? Because uh, hmm, because I'm not sure that I understand all that you sp spoke now, okay? I'm, I'm I, very sorry I, for my English. <laughs> it's completely fine. I uh, actually replied now uh, to your chat. I wrote Syriana Analysis, the name of my YouTube channel. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I post videos on YouTube and I write also on Twitter and on Facebook and uh, all other platforms. Okay. Uh, I usually post once per week uh, a video. La the, my last video mm -hmm. was about why Azerbaijan uh, and Israel uh, are uh, allies together, why this bizarre alliance between Azerbaijan and, and, and uh, Israel against Armenia. I explained uh, mm -hmm. like the reasons are Iran. Uh, Azerbaijan is a, a reconnaissance and a spying uh, advanced uh, land to, re to spy on Iran. And two is the oil. 40% of uh, Israel's oil consumption comes from Azerbaijan. And um, the, the third reason is to cause uh, trouble in the Southern Caucasus in order to drag Iran and Russia into this conflict. Um, so you can watch this. I'm also adding uh, um, uh, Arabic subtitles, uh, uh, okay. uh, but it's mostly English with Arabic subtitles nowadays. Uh, okay, thank you very much. But your yeah, English is very understandable, but but it's my problem. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you're, you're... Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Mike has asked us a question. 
Turkey has already taken over the Alexandrita governorate of Syria in the past several decades ago. Uh, does Turkey intend to gain even more territory and keep on holding and grabbing more territory from Syria? Actually, it was uh, France who granted uh, Hatay region, or in Arabic uh, we call the Skandaron area, to Turkey. Uh, it was a really bizarre situation after especially World War I. Uh, the Soviet Union gave uh, nagorno karabakh the current where the conflict is happening, to Azerbaijan in order to tease Turkey. And the French also gave uh, Skandaron to uh, Turkey in order to appease, because Turkey is a very important geopolitical uh, player, and its position is very crucial for all the powers to have good relations with. And the current uh, uh, president, especially Erdogan, he knows this fact, and that's why he's diversifying his relations between uh, Russia and the United States, and he's trying to gain as much as he can from both uh, powers. Uh, as, as underground, um, it, like Turkish military posts exist in Idlib, it exists in Afrin, it exists in Jarablus, and it exists in Tel Abyad. There are a few hundreds of uh, Turkish uh, soldiers underground, uh, but most of the fighting and most of the occupation force underground are two mercenaries. And when I say mercenaries, of course, they hold the Syrian uh, nationality. However, they fight for Erdogan and they are gaining, uh, they are getting paid per month. Uh, for example, fighting in uh, in Libya or in Azerbaijan, they are promised to be paid $1,600 uh, per month, but um, the reality is they are getting paid around $600 uh, dollars, uh, for a month. So three months contract, $1,800. Uh, it's a very big money for uh, the Syrians. Uh, I mean, the, the average salaries nowadays is Twenty to thirty to forty dollars. So six hundred dollar is a very big money. If they return back alive, that could make a, a huge amount of money. So yes, underground uh, Turkey is occupying Idlib, is occupying Jarablus, is occupying Afrin, is occupying Tel Abyad. It tried to advance towards Kamishli as well, east, much more east, but it was uh, blocked by the Syrian side uh, because it striked a deal with the Kurds. And uh, Syria sent reinforcement to uh, the uh, Kamishli area in order to stop the advance of uh, the Turkish side, but also Russia had a big role in this regard. But in the future, in my opinion, the only side capable of pushing Turkey out of Syria is Russia. Uh, Russia, till the moment, doesn't show intention uh, to uh, go. Uh, like fully against uh, Erdogan's occupation of Syria. Uh, Putin is trying to um, contain uh, the situation uh, until uh, the balance of power changes or through time maybe some realities underground change. Um, but Turkey doesn't have um, uh, like a future in Syria, similar to the American uh, occupation in the uh, eastern side of the Euphrates. However, as I mentioned, Turkey will only withdraw from Syria when uh, it creates a new realities on the ground by pushing the, Kurd uh, the Kurdish population at least 20 kilometers from its uh, southern borders and uh, to uh, create a situation that it can send back the refugees uh, because they have around 2 million refugees in Turkey to these parts, to resettle them there and to create a, a, a communities after indoctrination and education and etc. that these people are uh, loyal to him and not to Syria. Uh, we'll be taking our last one or two questions. So if anyone has any question to ask, you can please go ahead and ask it by unmuting yourself. I think Agina has asked one more question in the chat box. Um, do you know some Russian political scientists or orientalist uh, who can independently cover the problem of Armenia and Azerbaijan given the historical background? Uh, there are a few actually who are addressing this issue, but uh, basically, uh, um, 
there is a big polarization uh, even among the Russians. Some of them are very biased towards uh, Azerbaijan. Some of them very biased towards Turkey. If you give me the chance to reply to this question so that I can give you credible people who are covering the war in Azerbaijan, between Azerbaijan and, and, and Armenia, I could send it uh, through uh, email uh, to our partners and they can uh, deliver it uh, to you. But there are few in my mind, but I just want to make sure that I'm not mentioning any wrong names or wrong sources. Perfect. So, yeah, you can go work and Elgina. Yeah, go ahead, Elgina. Uh, so, sorry, I'm uh, I'm half of Armenian and Serbian. Uh, so um, now I'm in an organization um, in a Don uh, Youth Armenian organization from the Caucasus. So I'm interested in this uh, in this uh, topic because um, um, I want uh, I want that people know uh, historical context because uh, now we have. Uh, as you said, uh, polar um, opinions. Uh, yeah, yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, and um, I'm not sure that uh, um, that people know uh, the truth. So uh, uh, there is an Armenian truth and uh, Azerbaijan truth. Uh, uh -huh. That that is not truth for us. Yes. Mm. Uh -huh. So I want uh, I want an independent uh, opinion. Mm. If you if you understand me, <laughs> okay. Yes, I, actually, I also I also have an Armenian origins, uh, but uh, it's very clear yes, if, you, if you if you if we read the documents, uh, it's very clear uh, without any bias that Azerbaijan was formed after World War One, and so it was declared in 1918. Yes, yes. There, no, there was no Azerbaijan yes, I mean. before that. Yes. So uh, when when the war first World War ended, Stalin came and he occupied Na Nagorno Karabakh. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. 23, he gave Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan uh, as, a gift, yeah. as a gift to appease also Turkey and Azerbaijan. And uh, uh, when the World War II was over, Azerbaijan registered this territory on uh, her name. So it's very easy to debunk this narrative that um, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh belongs to Azerbaijan on paper, but what's the historical context of it? It is similar to uh, like Skandaron. Uh, Skandaron area was given by France to the Turks, and the Turks registered this area on their name after World War II, similar to Azerbaijan registered this territory on their name after World War II. So, of course, on a paper, mm -hmm. you could see if you if you if you're a lazy journalist who doesn't read and doesn't want to do research, uh, similar to many journalists, of course, you can go to Wikipedia and you think that this is an Azerbaijani land and that Armenia is the aggressor there. But they don't know the context, yes, they don't yes. know the history of it, how it that, how this happened and why this happened and why uh, a 90 percent of ethnic Armenians should live under Azerbaijan, especially according to international law, the people have the right for self-determination and they can vote for it. And all these uh, factors are not uh, taken into consideration by many journalists and they just think that it's Armenia who's occupying the Azerbaijani land, which is very untrue in my opinion. I also made a video about it on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can also watch it uh, for historical uh, context of the Nagorno-Karabakh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I, I will watch it. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Sadly, we have only that much time to discuss as we could have. So maybe you can take this over and Ajina and Kevok, I'll be sharing your email IDs with each other so that Kevok can send you the email with the link of the scholars. And Kevok, maybe you can take a minute and tell us how others can reach out to your work, your social media outlets and everything. Take a minute. Uh, actually, my uh, YouTube channel, which I created in early 20, uh, 2017, is called Syriana Analysis. Uh, it's not Syrian Analysis, but Syriana Analysis. I exist uh, on um, YouTube, on Twitter, and Facebook. And soon I will expand to Instagram and uh, to other uh, platforms as well. And vi I mostly create video content uh, that I explain things from a geopolitical perspective, similar to what I already did with you. But uh, on my YouTube channel, I speak in English and I add Arabic subtitles also for the Arabic audience. And uh, thankfully, I have uh, I reached to around 7.5 million views 
uh, in the last three years and mostly are from Western uh, countries, the targeted audience that I wanted to talk to. And hopefully, thanks to you and thanks to your also support, I could grow uh, my um, uh, like the reach of my people and I can reach also more in Eastern uh, countries. Thank you so much, Kevok, and thank you so much, everyone. This is all for today, and hopefully, we'll listen to Kevok Almasyan once again on our channel. So, this is Young Diplomats, and I'm Jyoti. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. You can disconnect us now. Thank you, Kevok.